It will regulate a militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Thanks so much for tuning in to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. It is great to have you with uh, me on the program today. I'm not going to say us because I don't have a guest today. Instead, uh, you and I are going to be talking all about what happened in the Virginia House of Delegates on Tuesday where uh, House Democrats, uh, along partisan lines, approved House Bill 961, Governor Ralph Northam's gun ban, magazine ban, suppressor ban, trigger activator ban. Uh, Now, there was bipartisan opposition to this bill. You did have some Democrats uh, vote against Northam's gun ban. Unfortunately, not enough. Uh, And so the bill is now heading over to the Virginia State Senate, where it does face an uncertain future. And we'll talk about what that future looks like. But I also want to look back at, at how this bill uh, looked when it was first introduced. And as a matter of fact, how Northam's gun ban looked when it was first introduced as a Senate bill that ultimately was killed by its original sponsor. Because one thing I, I think we all need to understand here is that it is far more important to Ralph Northam and Virginia Democrats that they pass something they can call a gun ban. It doesn't really matter what these specifics are, or at least the specifics don't matter as much as being able to hold that press conference and to be able to put something on the books that they can build on. So let's flash back to November. Shortly after Democrats took control of the state legislature in Virginia, giving them complete control of the state government for the first time in 26 years. One of the first pieces of legislation that was introduced was a a bill called Senate Bill 16. It was introduced by Senator Dick Saslaw, who was the incoming Senate Majority Leader. This had the backing of Governor Northam, uh, and it was a ban on the possession, on the sale, on the transfer, manufacture, transportation of so-called assault weapons, magazines over 10 rounds, all suppressors, and uh, anything that the bill defined as a trigger activator, including bump stocks and binary triggers. It would have made continued possession of these items a felony in the state of Virginia. And there was an immediate backlash. I mean, we saw the birth of the Second Amendment sanctuary movement which is really unlike anything seen in in modern political history in the state of Virginia, where hundreds and then thousands of residents were showing up at their county uh, commission meetings or the county supervisors meeting, uh, urging these supervisors to to pass resolutions and say, listen, we're not going to enforce any unconstitutional gun control laws here. And the response from Democrats, frankly, was very confused. It was, it was muddled. There was no one unifying message. Uh, you remember Don McEach and the uh, congressman from Virginia came out and said, well, Northam needs to call out the National Guard. And you had Mark Carey say, well, uh, you know, Virginians will just comply. They'll just comply with whatever we pass. And then Northam comes out and says, well, you know, um, maybe that language is a little extreme. And Dick Saslaw the original sponsor of the bill, said, oh, yeah, I never meant to take anybody's guns away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill this bill. They were not expecting the backlash that they received. And uh, Ralph Northam, and again, think of Ralph Northam as a politician. Don't think of him as an ideologue. Think of him as a politician. Ralph Northam, I do believe, really, truly would love to see the legislation in Senate Bill 16 be the law in the state of Virginia. But he's a politician. Politicians care about getting as much as they can, not about getting everything that they want. They're not going to let what they would consider to be good be the enemy of perfect, right? So Northam now knows, okay, I'm not going to be able to, to get that through the uh, legislature, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say we're going to pull that bill back, we're going to introduce a, a House measure, uh, and, and people will really like that, right? Weeks go by. Senator Saslaw's gun ban was one of the first bills that was dropped, pre-filed, uh, for the legislative session. But, but after this backlash, they did not introduce House Bill 961 until the day before the session began, January 7th. And then we saw that really the only substantive change to the bill 
was that the ban on uh, the continued possession of your so-called assault weapon had been dropped, and instead you could receive permission from the Virginia State Police to continue to own the gun that you currently own as long as you registered yourself and your firearms with the state police. Yeah. So now you'd have a list of all those guns that uh, you actually told people would be a, a felony for them to possess originally. You got a list of who owns them. You got a list of what they are. As you can imagine, that didn't fly either. We started hearing from uh, Virginia state senators, four of them, that they objected to the language of House Bill 961. A couple of them actually came out and said, all right, I'm not going to support a ban on, on guns or magazines. And Democrats over on the House side were concerned. So the bill was introduced on January the 7th, crossover deadline. Bills originating in the House have to cross over to the Senate. Uh, Senate have to cross over to the House, February 11th. And House Bill 961 does nothing for weeks. Doesn't get a committee hearing. Doesn't start moving. It's just sitting there. Because it doesn't have the support. Meanwhile, Governor Northam and uh, Democrat House leadership, they really want this bill. I mean, this is sort of the centerpiece of the governor's gun control proposals. If they can't get this through, you know, it'll be, again, it'd be good for the governor, but he wants it to be great. And he thinks he can get it. And again, he's got a lot of wiggle room. He's got a lot of room to negotiate here. So the first thing that goes when the bill does start moving, because it was Fisher cut bait time. So they had to schedule it for a committee hearing, hoping that they had the votes to get it. And they started watering it down. All right, so we're going to drop the, the registration requirement for the so-called assault weapons. Now it's just a grandfather clause. Uh, no more could people buy them. No more could people uh, manufacture them. Uh, limited transfers, but, uh, but you can keep them if you got them. And you don't have to register them with the state. That brought some folks on board. They raised the magazine ban from 10 to 12 rounds, which I got to be honest with you, I don't think that did a single thing other than demonstrate how arbitrary and capricious this entire piece of legislation is. Because there's no substantive difference between 10 or 12 rounds. Why not 15 rounds? Why not 20 rounds? But uh, they raised that limit. So again, I guess they could try to claim to be moderate here on this issue. Uh, and they ended up dropping suppressors uh, from the list of banned items. Again, grandfathering them in, so no future sales. But uh, but then you could maintain possession of the suppressors that you currently own. And I can tell you, based on the gun store owners that I know and I'm talking to, suppressors are flying off the shelves right now. Um, and, and actually, somebody who just bought one a couple of months ago uh, did not take long at all, actually, to get their, uh, their, their NFA approval. So don't know what that means, but I, I, I imagine that we're going to see continued strong sales of suppressors going forward. That was enough to get the bill out of committee. Then it goes on to the House floor, and it's watered down even further because, again, uh, there wasn't at that point enough support to bring people on board. So the possession of a magazine over 12 rounds, uh, the, the penalty for that was reduced from a felony to a misdemeanor, and the bill narrowly passes I think with a three-vote margin, 51-48. Uh, again, I think there were three Democrats who voted against this measure. No Republicans voted for it. Now it goes over to the uh, state Senate side, where, ostensibly, you still have four Democrat state senators who, who object to the language, although they now can say, well, I, I objected to the original language, but it was changed enough that, uh, that I could support it. And that's my concern. They can also modify it further. They could drop that misdemeanor of, 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 of crime of possessing a magazine. And by the way, it would still be a felony to transport a magazine that could hold more than 12 rounds. You could possess one. That'd be, a, well, you couldn't. It'd be a misdemeanor to possess. It'd be a felony to transport. But they can change that too over on the Senate side. Senator Linwood Lewis, for example, could say, listen, I, I'm on the record as saying I can't support a, a gun or a magazine ban, uh, laws that would make it illegal for people to uh, continue to own what they already own. 
So let's just grandfather these folks in, uh, ban them going forward, and, and, and I'd be good with that. I don't know that, there's a, that that is what Senator Linwood Lewis would say, and I hope that it is not. But what I'm saying is there's still that room for negotiation. There's still some horse trading possibilities here. Now, one bit of good news if we're reading the tea leaves, and that's kind of all we're doing here. There was a proposal backed by Governor Northam that was voted down in the Virginia State Senate on Tuesday. Same day the House is passing this gun ban, Senate Bill 67 was killed by the Virginia State Senate. That is a bill that would have set a civil penalty for gun owners who did not report lost or stolen firearms within 24 hours to their local police departments. And there were two Democrat state senators who voted against that bill, and they provided that margin that allowed the bill to be defeated. Those two state senators, Senator Linwood Lewis, guy I just mentioned, uh, based out of the Eastern Shore, a little bit of Norfolk, and uh, Chap Peterson, who is a state senator from Northern Virginia, believe it or not, but a guy who has, uh, over on the Senate already this session, moderated a, a lot of these really awful proposals and made them just terrible proposals, right? They're, they're still not supportable, but he's made them slightly less awful. And he voted against this measure yesterday, lost or stolen. Now, I believe that House Bill 961 is a far more egregious bill than Senate Bill 67, as bad as Senate Bill 67 was. So I would like to think that we start right now over on the state Senate side with those two state senators opposed to House Bill 961. The other two state senators who have expressed their opposition to House Bill 961, as it was originally written, uh, State Senator Cray Deeds, who has voted for every gun control proposal that I've seen. Uh, I don't think he's voted in opposition to anyone yet. And uh, State Senator John Edwards, who has also uh, voted to approve every gun control bill that, uh, that, that's been uh, brought up on the Senate floor. Uh, so that's where we stand at the moment. I, I cannot tell you that there is a 100% certainty that the Senate is going to pass this bill. I can't tell you that there's 100% certainty that the Senate is going to defeat this bill. I think that is very much up in the air. I think Virginia gun owners very much have a role to play in that regard. Right now, if you are a Virginia gun owner, you need to contact your state senator. It doesn't really matter who they are, but particularly if your state senator is one of the four that I just mentioned, Senator Linwood Lewis, Senator Chad Peterson, Senator John Edwards, Senator Craig Deeds, you definitely need to be in contact with their office. You need to let them know that House Bill 961 is unsupportable in any form or fashion. And I do think we've got a chance to defeat this bill. And this bill, even if it were to be watered down to the point that, you know, everything was grandfathered in and only going forward were uh, these items banned, that would still be a violation of the rights of Virginians because it still maintains that really none of these items are protected by the Second Amendment. It's all a, a privilege to own these items. It's just that the state is allowing this group of people to, to, to do so. And everybody else can't. But what's to change that in the future? Hang on a second. I should have turned off my phone before I uh, started doing this call or before I started doing the uh, the program here. I may just have to edit that out. I think I'm going to go ahead and leave that in. All right. Anyway, um, you know, once this law is on the books, again, they can go back and they can revise this and amend it next year. And they will try to do so if they get this uh, on the books. And we know what they want. We know what they originally proposed. We know what they have given up uh, over the course of this legislative process in order to get something on the books. So we know what they would want to add back in. We know what they will try to do next year or the year after that, if given the opportunity. And none of it's good for gun owners. This also, again, would uh, tell anybody moving to the state of Virginia, can't bring your legally owned AR-15, can't bring your commonly owned magazines, can't bring your suppressors. So again, it, it takes the ownership of all of these items, some of the most commonly owned firearms and accessories in the country today, and it takes them outside of the protection of the Second Amendment 
your right to keep and bear arms, and it places them in a little tiny box. And then the state will open up that box and dole out that privilege only to those it sees fit, and only for as long as they see fit to do so. So, all right, that's where we are right now. Uh, I tell you what, let's get to today's armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report as well. Actually, there's one thing I forgot. Uh, So I mentioned before that Virginia Democrats are desperate to actually avoid calling House Bill 961 a gun ban, right? Okay, so take a look at this tweet from, this is the bill sponsor, Delegate Mark Levine, uh, responding to a tweet from WSET in Virginia, uh, they tweet out, breaking Virginia House votes to pass Delegate Mark, uh, Delegate Mark Levine's bill to ban assault weapons in Virginia. And Mark Levine says, correction, the bill does not ban assault weapons in Virginia, but it does regulate them. Possession is allowed. Purchases, sales, and transfers are restricted. Have you ever seen a gun control advocate go out of their way to say, oh, no, no, it's not a gun ban. As a matter of fact, the Brady campaign is calling it a gun ban. March for Our Lives is calling it a gun ban. Gun control groups are calling it a gun ban. Mark Levine is not calling it a gun ban. Why is that? I believe it's because those four Democrat state senators have said they're not going to vote for a gun ban. And so this can't be a gun ban if it's going to get the support of those four state senators. So Mark Levine is playing some uh, linguistic games here in proclaiming that this bill, which does ban the sale, the manufacture, the uh, transfer, and the possession of these firearms from anybody moving in from out of state, for example, and these magazines and these suppressors, he's trying to claim that this bill does not ban these guns, these magazines, these suppressors. Well, it it certainly does. For anybody going forward, they're not going to be allowed to own them. And again, those currently legal gun owners in Virginia who possess these items will only be allowed to do so if House Bill 961 becomes law, if the state gives them permission to do so, because it removes the uh, Second Amendment uh, protections from these items and again, declares them to be simply privileges. All right, now let's get to our armed citizen story, our recidivist report, our uh, a good deed of the day. In fact, we will start with our recidivist report from Tulsa, Oklahoma, where uh, this homicide suspect, Carl Irons, is getting a repeat message from police. This is so sad. Uh, Channel 6 News in Tulsa reporting on this uh, young man who's wanted for murder, and they actually played a soundbite from 2017 where a Tulsa police sergeant, uh, Marcus Harper, says, we got a pretty good idea who he is, so if he's watching this newscast, we implore you to turn yourself in and not have us out here looking for you because we're going to catch you. That was after Irons was accused of a shooting... In 2017, he was uh, eventually caught and arrested, and he's already back out on the streets and accused now of murder. Channel 6 in Tulsa says police say Iron shot and killed 16-year-old Jeremiah Morris last week while on probation for a 2017 shooting. Jeremiah's family tells News on 6 that uh, they are hoping both suspects are caught so they can get justice for Jeremiah. Uh, Tulsa police say uh, Jeremiah Morris was with a group of people going to buy a gun uh, near uh, 4th and Mingo from Carl Irons Jr. When Morris's group handed the gun over to Irons, Irons decided he'd use it to rob them. Both sides were armed, leading to a shootout. Um, one lieutenant with the Tulsa Police Department says they're young and obviously made a lot of bad decisions on both sides. Yeah, but let's talk about the bad decisions from the criminal justice system that allowed this murder suspect to be on the streets. Channel 6 says that Irons is serving a deferred sentence for a crime committed in 2017, arrested for shooting a 24-year-old uh, multiple times at an apartment complex in Tulsa. They said they believe the shooting was the result of a feud between Irons and another man. Irons was 16 at the time. Lieutenant Watkins with the Tulsa Police Department said, I think sometimes judges and attorneys assume that they've learned their lesson. 
Turns out they do something even more ignorant, and people end up dying because they don't learn their lesson. 16 years old, shot a guy multiple times. Three years later, he's already on probation. I, I, again, I'm at a loss for words. But, you know, when you can just recycle sound bites for criminals who aren't even 20 years old, and you can play something that somebody said about him three years earlier and it applies today, that's a, a sign that the criminal justice system is broken. Is it not? All right, let's get to um, let's get to armed citizen story of the day from Indiana, Grant County, Indiana, where uh, police say a home intruder uh, was uh, shot and killed by homeowners uh, near Gas City. Grant County Sheriff's Department says it got a nine one one call about one p.m. Monday afternoon from a uh, homeowner who said he had just shot and killed an intruder at his home. Uh, sheriff's deputies arrived, found two people outside of the home that were taken into protective custody. Uh, two people, or one of those two people, uh, arrested on a parole violation. They also found a, a dead man lying on the floor near the uh, back door of the home. Uh, that man identified as 33-year-old Stephen Nickel. The uh, sheriff says uh, nature and cause of the shooting is still under investigation. Uh, Grant County Sheriff's Department still investigating. Several interviews have been conducted. But uh, right now it looks like to be a case of self-defense. We'll keep our eyes on this story. We'll give you any uh, details as they become available. And finally, our good deed of the day from Utah, where uh, Channel 13 KUTV reporting that a West Valley City police officer hoping to deliver a baby, Officer Jeremy Dean, was uh, driving on patrol when a man in the car in front of him abruptly stopped. The uh, man got out, waved Officer Dean down. Turns out the man's wife was in labor. They were not going to make it to the uh, local hospital. And so Officer Dean uh, put on the spot. As the uh, police department said in a Facebook post, he, quote, grabbed some gloves and right there caught this brand new baby girl as she made her entrance into the world. Thankfully, a West Valley City fire crew showed up quickly, got the new baby and her mom safely to the hospital. Uh, Officer Dean is a four-year veteran of the force, says that even though he has kids of his own, this was a first. He says he usually leaves the catching of babies up to the doctors. So there you go. In the right place, at the right time. Able to make a great catch. Uh, Officer Jeremy Dean, we thank you, sir, for your good deed. Now, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. Thank you for being a part of the program today. Just a reminder, if you're a Virginia gun owner, contact your state senator. If you're a gun owner, contact your state legislators, because I guarantee you there's something going on in your state that you should be concerned about. Uh, we'll have more of the latest segment of news and information from all across the nation coming up on tomorrow's Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Don't forget, you can subscribe to the program at Town Hall Media on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the townhall.com podcast page as well. And you can become a VIP member of BearingArms.com, get exclusive analysis, commentary, and help support the work that we do there covering the Second Amendment news that you need to know about. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow on another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company.